there was this local charity and the director was trying to raise additional funding for their work and he decided to call the town's banker. He called him up and says, you know, sir, uh, we, we are aware that you make nearly a million dollars a year and yet you do almost nothing to give to local charities. Don't you want to help your community? And the banker says, well, did your research and looking when you were looking into me, did you find out that, that my mother is ill with very expensive medical bills? And he said, well, no, we didn't know that. Said, well, did you know that my brother is employed or that my sister's husband is left, leaving her broke and with all these children to take care of? And the director of the charity said, no, oh, I'm sorry, no, I, I didn't know that either. And he, the banker continues, says, so if I don't give them any money, why do you think I'd give some to you? <laughs> okay. Oh, well, interesting today's message is about serving. So that's going to actually fit in here because uh, obviously the opposite there. Um, why don't you go ahead and pull out your, your Bibles, phones, tablets, whatever you're going to use this morning. We're going to go into John chapter 13 and pull that out and have it ready. But we're not going to get to the text for a, a moment here. A few years ago, I was asked to help somebody learn how to play bass guitar. Um, I enjoy playing the bass. I enjoy learning, um, you know, new theories and patterns. There's all kinds of things you can do. Um, bass is kind of a nice, it's kind of a fun instrument to learn because it's relatively simple. And yet there's all these things you can add and continue the development of, of, uh, of the instrument. And he came to me and he asked if I would teach him how to play the bass. And I said, sure, would you like to get together? And he says, well, oh, I was thinking maybe I could just join your band and I'll just follow along and I'll learn as we go and uh, so we we talked talk about that and and uh, I thought that he actually was a little further along than he really was and so we let him come for one night and uh, just try to kind of sit in with us and you know play in the back I gave him a little bit of you know thoughts and things here and in, here and there in between songs that we were practicing and working on and uh, really it turned out at the end of the day he had a long way to go and he was much more of a distraction to our practice than any kind of a help and so I talked to him afterwards and said you know I'd love to I'd be more than happy to to help you learn how to play the bass but I don't think it's worth you know, coming to our band practice. So we need instruction and time. He's actually offended that I said that. He, he was offended that I didn't think he was um, ready to sit in with our group. And it turned out, you know, really what the, the problem was, um, as I came kind of realize after a couple actions, he thought he was a bass player, but he just didn't know how to play the bass. <laughs> Imagine that. And you run into people like that, you run into situations like that from time to time. People that kind of think they know more than they do, they're ready for more than they are, they want more than they can handle, and so on. And it kind of dawned on me, I, I think there's a connection here for sometimes the way we think of ourselves as Christians. You see, to be a follower of Jesus, you have to actually follow Jesus. You cannot have Jesus in your heart unless you give him access to your life. And if we want to be Christian, and if we want to uh, live out the life that God calls us to, if we want to actually um, have the kind of life that brings glory to the Father, does the mission that he's given us to live, if we want to actually be followers of Christ, then we need to follow Christ. And we have to live our lives that way. Now we're going to be reading in John chapter 13 today, as I mentioned. And um, I want to look at one of the verses first. And I normally don't do this. Uh, um, uh, I think it's really important we don't read just one verse and try to make a whole thing out of it. I try not to do that. Um, but instead, look at the context. You need to see the whole you know, paragraph, the whole section, the whole teaching, whatever. You need, to, you need to see any verse that you're studying within the, the context of what the Bible's really trying to say. Um, but verse 8 is what I want to look at first. And what happens is, is, as I was reading it, I just thought that verse blended, if you will, it just kind of blended in the wallpaper of the narrative. But when I took and pulled it out and just tried to consider that particular, it, it, it kind of came alive for me. 
and I hope it says something to us this morning. Um, and as uh, I have in other weeks, I challenge you, I want you to read the whole chapter this afternoon, you know, when you go home. We will in a moment read the opening section. But Jesus is talking to his disciples, and in verse 8, he says to them, uh, to Peter in particular, and we'll see how that fits into the story. But he's talking to them, and he says to Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. In this story, Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. It's an odd scene to them, to be sure. Um, it, it would really be not much different as if I said, you know, there's not going to be a sermon today. Would the ushers bring in some basins of water, and I'm going to go around and I'm going to just wash everybody's feet in the room. Now, you are actually, it's the early part of the day. I imagine most of you have, uh, have showered this morning and you came in and you, uh, you have shoes on and you drove in a car. And so you're already relatively clean. <clears throat> They're at the end of their day. They've walked the muddy streets. And Jesus stands up at the end of their dinner and he dons a towel around his waist. He gets a basin and some water and he bends down uh, to begin washing the feet of the disciples. And they're in a rather sense of shock and awe as uh, this was going on. And then Jesus is going around and he gets to Peter. And, and, and if you know anything about Peter, you know that he was bold, he was strong, he uh, was... Um, he was prone at times to put his foot in his mouth. I know a little bit about that. And uh, he says, Lord, what are you doing? You, you are going to wash my feet? And of course, he has great love and honor for, for Christ. And Peter can't imagine allowing Jesus to do this, to, to stoop down, to take on this role of a servant, to wash his feet. And he says, you'll never wash my feet. And then those words from Jesus, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. I think this becomes an interesting example. It really says something to us. And he's talking again within the context of, of this foot washing. But here's Peter, a disciple, a follower, a learner, somebody that is looking to Jesus as his, not only his teacher, but then his rabbi and even his Lord. And Jesus coming to him and saying, and now you need to learn the most important part. Ultimately, he's talking about learning how to serve, but it begins by allowing Jesus to serve him. It began with allowing Jesus to wash his feet. And I just think there's a question, is this at least where I kind of got, got buried this week as I thought about it over and over. Are you letting Jesus wash over you? Do you let him wash you and over your life? It's no doubt, we, we've said it many times, that these are difficult, these are challenging times in an ever-changing culture. There's an interesting uh, verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And I want you to grasp it. It talks about the difficulties faced at the end times. And um, here Paul is teaching young Timothy to be prepared. He says to him, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, and without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. They will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Wow. What a list. And those are things that are uh, pretty bad. And he says, this is the source, verse 5, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. For among them there are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sin and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And think for a moment 
who Paul is talking to, who he's teaching when he says these words. He's not talking to atheists here. He's not talking about standing on the street corner and preaching to the marketplace. This is a teaching Paul is giving to Timothy to watch out because these difficult times are an explanation of what's going to happen in the church. Of what's going on in the church. He said, watch out for this in the church. He says, the days are coming when it's going to be so bad, it's going to be so difficult. You can hardly imagine the trouble that you'll have to face. And what are they? What are the problems that he's that he's getting at and then, then of course the list and the bottom line is it's this I can do it myself attitude that's where he started that's where the, the list kind of began with when he says that um, for people will be lovers of self that's the first thing he pointed to and, and I heard someone say that that's the sewer pipe that fills all the rest it's an interesting thought when Sandy was growing up in her home um, her parents owned horse races. Uh, horse races. Her parents owned race horses. That makes more sense. <laughs> her, her parents owned race horses. And uh, they, had a, they had a few different ones. And uh, usually one, one at a time. And it was kind of a partnership thing. Uh, it was kind of interesting. They, they, when we started dating, their horse ran one night. And we went down to watch. The name of their horse was... I can make it on my own. Um, I, I thought I, it's kind of an interesting, um, interesting thing because there's no way the horse could make it on its own. He had a, you know, he had owners and and caretakers and trainers and there was like all and, you know the jockey. There was all these people that helped the horse make it, and it was like this whole team effort. But I'm making it on it, it, it. But it was called I can make it on my own. And I thought what. What a what a, a a title for American living. I can make it on my own. <laughs> but that's unfortunately the attitude that we can live with. I can do it by myself. I'm a lover of myself. I'm interested mostly in myself. I can get by. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the things that fill me. And then all the other things fall in line. Becoming lovers of money, becoming proud, becoming arrogant, becoming abusive, becoming uh, uh, all these other things that they talks about. And it all starts with this, with this first step of being a lover of yourself. He starts there. And this is a problem that's in the church. And we got to recognize that. We got to deal with that. And we need to expect that. It's, it's our flesh. We're just people trying to, to, uh, to, to make it on our own. And we don't always see how we become proud and abusive and arrogant. Interesting, he talked about being disobedient to parents. Aren't we almost kind of shocked when we see children today that actually behave and honor their parents? It's like they're the anomaly and not the norm. Disobedience and rebellion is so commonplace. And, and, and we just have a society that, that builds on this idea that you can do and be anything you want to be. We see a child that's actually disciplined. It's like they're a super child with super parents. Where did you come from? The problem is that we're so selfish and proud. And Paul says that we can love pleasure more than we love God. And we have to wonder, it's no wonder that the last thing that Jesus taught his disciples was to stoop down and serve the world. It's no wonder that, that I mean, this is the last encounter. He says to them, he teaches them, he shows them by his own actions to take on the lowliest of spots. And say it's not about you. And we live in a time when we need to be growing stronger in the Lord. We need to be prepping and building disciples. We need to be growing in this power of Christ. And finding the, the power that's available in the gospel. 
And if this challenge to Timothy is true today, instead of doing those things, what we're really doing is serving our own selfish desires, interests, wants, and ideas. You see, within Jesus, we believe that the power of the gospel, the power of Christ, is that Jesus can heal the brokenness. We believe that Jesus can find the lost. We believe that Jesus can give courage to the weak. He can forgive the shame of the sinner. We believe that Jesus can break the addiction of selfishness. We believe Jesus can give hope to those that have fallen. And that he can take away the bitterness that, that is, is born in your pain. We believe Jesus can restore even what the enemy has stolen. But not if we've got an I'll do it myself attitude. Not if we've got it, I can find the way I am mentality or lifestyle. If we're just playing like everything is happy and fine, and I'm just a part of the group, I'm glad to be here, this is all good, I can take care of myself, I've got enough, there's no power in what Christ really wants to do. You have to let Jesus wash over you. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the text. Um, John 13. Um, you know, it opens up in verse 1 with, this, with them being at the Last Supper, a familiar scene. We share in communion um, once or twice a month, kind of uh, reflecting that moment with Jesus and his disciples. Um, and then this is another part that happens uh, at that dinner. In verse 2, it says, During the supper, what we refer to often as the Lord's Supper, he says, When the devil had already put it into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, this is a really long sentence, by the way, so get ready. <laughs> it's a little confusing. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Jesus rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and he taken a towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you should never wash my feet, Jesus answered. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <coughs> Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. He's talking about a Judas. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. So I want us to ponder <coughs> these two things. In terms of what, what do we need from Jesus? We need to let him wash you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to do a really poor job of kind of trying to draw that apart. I, I, it was kind of, it was, the idea was capturing me of how do we let Jesus do this work? How can I get to that place of freedom? How can I get to that place of wholeness? How can I get to that place of holiness? How can I become more like Christ? How can I let, you know, live this out so that I allow Jesus to wash over me? <clears throat> and, and I think the answer is simple and complex at the same time. But just if we broke it down, the first thing we need to do is we need to let him do it. Somehow we need to find a way to let him do it. We have to desire that. We have to want that. We have to open our life and open our heart and open ourselves to his work of washing over our lives, washing over our hearts, washing over our thoughts. We have to face this ugly, selfish side of ourselves and our flesh that desires to actually keep him out. We push him away. We can have, the, as, as, as uh, Paul said to Timothy, we can um, have this, this look of godliness and not have God. 
We have to see that it's more than an activity. It's more than a, a, a Sunday morning event. That walking and following Christ is more than just letting, um, just knowing about Him. We need to actually know Him. We have to let Him wash our life. Whatever that might look like, we have to lay our burdens down. We have to invite Christ into the battle and into the journey. Sandy asked me to let you, if you saw the video last night, um, we did this humorous little video. It was our account uh, offering of the evening. Um, and she's trying to, you know, read her Bible and <clears throat> trying to, uh, you know, spend time praying and so on. And all these interruptions kept happening. That was the little video. And it's, this is a humorous thing. And she says that everybody came up to her last night afterwards and says, you know what, that's exactly what it's like. I feel like that's what my prayer time's like too. And, and uh, but obviously, you know, we get the point. That's the challenge. Trying to overcome that. Trying to create isolation and space so we can spend time with the Lord. We're trying to make room where we let Him in. And we want to hear what He has to say. And we want to let Him wash over our lives as we're reading His Word and as we're in prayer. We're spending time in devotion as we're worshiping, as we're with learning, you know, with and learning from each other in fellowship. We want to lay down our burdens and we want to let Christ wash over our lives. We have to desire that. The day of the selfie needs to be over. <laughs> hey, can I get an amen? <laughs> Can you imagine what 30 years ago saying that you know what the focus of our life is going to be in 30 years? <laughs> the focus of life is going to be about everybody having their own page, their own little spot in the world where they invite the rest of the world and come and look at everything that they're doing and everything that they're about. <laughs> We have to face this ugly side of our flesh that is so into ourself and lay that down and be willing to cry out for the help of Jesus Christ. It is only through you I will understand and know what you want from me. It is only through you I'll find the healing that I need. It is only through you that I'm able to lay down my pain, lay down my flesh. And let you do the work that I need. And it seems to me, I've kind of said this before, it seems to me, church, the longer you walk with Christ, the less likely you are to do that work. Grayson intimated that earlier this morning. It becomes easier and easier to think we have it figured out. And I think it's the less likely we are to let him wash over us anew. And the second part is we need to let him wash you. We need to let him do it, and then we need to let him wash you. It's interesting how Peter comes in and his reply is, okay, okay then Lord, if that's what it is, then wash me. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Wash all of me. I'm ready. I give myself to you, Lord. And Jesus says, no, just your feet. I just need to wash your feet. The rest of you is clean. It's just your, your feet. You see, as we walk along this journey, we have a tendency to pick life up on ourselves. We have a tendency to kind of get the world on us. Not all is sinful. Not all is bad. Not all is wrong. It's just that what is dirty, we need to let Jesus wash. And so we reflect and we look and we take inventory of our life. We, we check our heart, we check our attitudes, we check our activities, we check where we're going and what we're doing. We look into these things and we ask Him, okay God, where are the areas that I've grown selfish? Where are the things that I'm doing that are not holy any longer? What are the things I need to change? What are the things I don't see? And will you wash me clean? And cleanse me. Not everything's dirty. And that's the problem. Is sometimes we think we're clean because we just have a few things, these little spots, these areas that are that we don't take to the Lord. 
But we have to take those, we have to do that work and look for what is sinful, look for what is dirty, and let him wash it out of our life. What does Jesus need to wash in you to cleanse you? Is it pride? Is it some secret sin? Is it the way you're self-medicating in your life? Is it an issue of ego? Maybe it's a place of pain that's just creating bitterness and anger into other areas. What is the spot in you that you need to allow Jesus to wash and cleanse you from? What do you need to let go of today and ask for His help to be just prepared and cleansed and washed today? The Bible even indicates to us that if we bring an offering unto the Lord and while we're Alter, we remember we have a problem with a brother or a sister. We're to leave our offering there and go make amends and come back. The Bible says we should never go to bed angry at night. What are the areas where you need Christ to wash you? And we've done this, we said this, you know, we've opened up the altars and we said, you know, have prayer and things and, uh, you know, meet with the Lord. Um, and we're going to do that again. I think Grayson's just going to do a little quiet acoustic song and um, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to have words or not, I don't know. I don't know, it's just a little off the cuff. <clears throat> but um, we just want to give that washing moment to you. What do you need from the Lord today? Where do you want to let Him work in you? Where are you resisting His call in your life? Or maybe you need His help. You would know your tendency to think that you can do it on your own because all of us do. And you reject that and say, No, I need Christ to help me today. And would you open your life, your heart, your just your experience to Him in the next few moments and let Jesus wash over you for whatever the area or the need is in your life.